I'm Dr. Mark Atala, and I want to welcome you to the 15th and final chapter of Bradbury and Carney's Intimate Relationships book. So today we'll be discussing improving relationships. So we'll talk about couples therapy. We'll have a lot of pictures of couples um, looking unhappy sitting on couches. And then some of the treatment approaches, an evaluation of couples therapy, and then talk about the bottom line of being happy in relationships. So you might want to just skip to that. Well, couples therapy involves professional counseling for couples, hence the term couples therapy, who are experiencing distress in their relationships. Now, the couple to the right has successfully resolved all their problems and they are joyful. Um, couples usually say that several years have passed though since, that they since they noticed that there was a problem and that they grow apart gradually and then there's some specific event that occurs that outstrips their ability to cope and then that's why they they seek counseling. So the most common problems are poor communication, power struggles, unrealistic expectations, a lack of love, and serious individual problems. Well, let's get started with systems models in terms of treatment. And they emphasize the repetitive patterns of partner interactions, as well as the unspoken rules and beliefs that govern them. And so they say, maybe we should talk about these rules. So problems arise not because of faults in the parties, but because their recurring patterns are ineffective in meeting new demands. So interventions are made to make, the, as I said earlier, the unspoken assumptions of the relationship explicit. So they want to reframe these things in a positive light. Um, I, I won't give you an example from, from couples therapy, but uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, when I fly, like most people, I can't stand turbulence. And so... Um, I, I was on a plane one time and we had some severe turbulence and a child started yelling, this is fun. And I thought, oh, that's a, that's a good cognitive reappraisal, a reframing of a terrorizing situation to say it's fun. And so that's what a systems model therapist would do. So the therapist can provide a newer, healthier way of interpreting their circumstances. That turbulence isn't scary, it's fun. Let's talk about behavioral models. Well, they specify features of effective communication, especially when discussing opinions. And because they believe that specific behaviors are the problem, so they don't care so much about the history of the couple because the history is in the past and you can't change the past. So three stages, behavioral exchange is the initial phase. And that reveals to the therapist how the couple can generate new positive experiences. Then comes communication training, and this is when people are taught how to listen and talk to each other productively, so no blaming and accusations, lots of I statements like, I don't like it when you leave the top off the toothpaste, rather than say, you shouldn't do that. And then finally, problem solving training, that's applying their communication skills to specific problems in their relationship, <laughs> like, like taking the top off the toothpaste. Cognitive behavioral couples therapy is also behavioral therapy. And the focus is on the interpretation of behaviors. So these are cognitive appraisals of events that tend to be distorted or extreme. So the accusation that you worked late because you don't really love me. And then the other person's like, no, I worked late because I had to get this project done or we lose the account. So you should say things like, thank you for making my coffee rather than you forgot to put milk in my coffee because you know I, I don't think they're going to make you coffee again after that. A problem is that people are irrational and they have standards of how a relationship should be. Um, and so uh, uh, Albert Ellis, who's one of the, the, really the founders of this type of therapy, he used to say anytime somebody says should, they're just shooting on themselves because it's irrational and it th think there's nothing that should happen. You should make me coffee in the morning or you should put milk in my coffee. These are irrational demands. The therapist makes them away, aware of their own assumptions and standards and says, well, you know, maybe you could change this. Integrative behavioral couples therapy um, uses behavioral interventions with techniques that help partners to tolerate or accept parts of the relationship that were displeasing. So promoting acceptance of what at, seems at first glance to be unacceptable. So you can see in the couple to the right there, he don't wanna hear about it, so he's, he's done. 
There's three techniques um, that fit this. Oh, and I can give you an example of this too. Um, I used to date someone who um, she, she had to have the sink. Every time you use the sink, you had to clean the sink because the sink always had to be photo shoot fresh. And so like if there was any water droplets or there were any, anything, big problems. So the three techniques to try to resolve that issue would be empathic joining, where the therapist defines the, or defines the problem without blaming. So the problem is uh, one person likes to keep things clean and the other doesn't see it as a big deal. Then unified detachment, you view the problems in neutral descriptive terms like, um, you know, it, it, you have, if everything's kept clean all the time, then less cleaning has to be done. Um, but some people don't value that as much. And then tolerance building, uh, the acceptance that some things won't change. Um, and so I was like, well, how about if I only use the sink in the basement and then I just clean it, you know, once a week. Emotion models uh, recognize the centrality of feelings and emotions and channel them in ways that bring couples together. I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm laughing at the picture to the right. None of these people seem to be very happy in their, their couples therapy. Greenberg and Johnson, who created this, this theory, aim to create bonds instead of bargains because they see behavioral therapy as just creating bargains between couples. So unmet needs produce strong primary emotions like sadness, shame, and helplessness, but these are masked by self-protection, protective secondary emotions like anger and contempt. So the therapy works through the secondary emotions, anger and contempt, to bring the primary emotions, sadness, shame, and helplessness out into the open. The therapist follows three distinct stages. So de-escalation of negative cycles. The therapist gets the couple to acknowledge that they both contribute to the problem. So going back to the sink cleaning issue that, you know, people have different standards of what they consider to be clean. Second stage is shaping new cycles of responsiveness and accessibility. Uh, partners learn more positive ways of approaching and responding to each other. So rather than throwing a towel at somebody and saying, clean that damn sink, um, they might say, hey, maybe you could wipe that sink out. Consolidation and integration. Uh, partners solve problems on their own and understand why the problems occurred. Well, let's evaluate this. Um, and so the effectiveness from um, of different therapeutic techniques comes from outcomes research. And so what provides the best outcomes for couples? And so efficacy studies occur in the laboratory. And what the, one of the things they find is that 10 to 15 hour counseling sessions brings about better functioning um, for most couples, two, three quarters of couples. But that's compared to doing nothing. And so uh, a better study is having couples do 10 to 15 hours of some fun, constructive activity together. Um, does that mean people are happy? No, only about 50% of people say the therapy worked. And 70% of couples can keep up the improvements for two years, but 38% divorce within four to five years. So this, this is an ongoing issue where uh, trying to keep things Field studies are conducted where therapy actually takes place. So they're less scientifically rigorous. Um, so they happen in the therapist's office and that couple to the right doesn't look happy either. Large numbers of couples drop out of therapy, but 30% of couples show improvement with 20% landing in the satisfied range of the relationship functioning. But success rates in field studies are lower than in efficacy studies. Well, Here's an issue too. Only a small minority of couples even seek therapy. Not all of them see benefits and even fewer will maintain improvements over the long term. So clinical psychologists strive to develop interventions to enhance relationships early on before the problems start. And so they use things like self-help books, personalized feedback and skills training. So uh, what are, what are the, the outcomes with this? Well. They have an initial impact that goes away within six months and weaken over time that couples in skill-based programs experience small improvements in their relationship satisfaction. And some couples benefit more than others from educational programs. So higher risk couples show more improvement than lower risk couples, probably because they have a lot more improvement to go through. 
Low risk couples, so this is ironic too, low risk couples are more likely to go through premarital counseling because they're, you know, they're trying to make things work. For a couple living with two low incomes, long commutes and different work schedules, the problem probably isn't training them in communication skills. It's probably um, giving, having them find steady jobs and more money. Um, and there's different ways to go about that too. So the problem might not be in their communication. It might be in larger economic issues. So I'm gonna finish this lecture as the book does, which it, with seriously, what should I do? Which is really the bottom line. And so I'm just gonna go through these and make a few comments. So the number one thing is to make an effort because relationships are work and it's work that doesn't end. And so you have, you're like Sisyphus pushing that boulder up a hill. Um, but happily. And so you, it's not like you're not hitting an end point. Keep your relationship fresh. Make your partner a priority. Uh, they should be, depending on your religious views, they should be the most important person in your life. Um, children are also important, but your partner should always be, um, your partner always comes first. Keep moving forward. Work for the future together. You have to realize that you're on the same team and that you want, you want each other to succeed. Uh, some people have said that relationships are like sharks, that they have to keep moving forward or they die. Create a sense of security. Show your partner gratitude, kindness, and humor. It goes a long way. Spend time together. I don't need to say anything else about that. The idea of quality time, uh, uh, it's quantity that makes that you, where you find the quality time. Communicate with sensitivity and clarity. Be polite and apologize. I've known many people who never apologize in a relationship. It's not, relationships aren't about winning an argument. What are you actually winning when, um, yeah, it's. Expect to be tested and it's not gonna be a written test. You're going to have to face problems together. Uh, you know, children get sick. Uh, In-laws can be a problem. Um, friends get divorced. These aren't the, the things that you really think about necessarily when you're, when you're dating somebody. Practice good mental hygiene. Give your partner the benefit of the doubt. Uh, assume that they have your best interests in mind and you'll be a happier person. Learn to talk effectively about difficult issues. So a lot of couples have sexual problems that they just don't discuss. Talk effectively about them, be direct, um, yeah. Be a good listener and responder. I can't stress this enough, turn off the damn TV, uh, no matter what you're watching. That's why they invented, uh, I don't know what it's called, is it TiVo where you can like rewind live television or whatever. Listen to your partner um, rather than giving them these half measures like where you're watching a TV show and trying to talk about something. Work on fully accepting your partner. Folks, you can't change people. There's gonna be things that you like about your partner. There's things you, you don't like about your partner and you have to say yes to both of them. So you don't just get to pick and choose. Relationships aren't a salad bar where you get to take the parts that you like and then just leave the parts that you don't. You gotta eat the whole salad bar. Look out for yourself. Um, some people have big problems like massive amounts of debt or serious drug and alcohol issues or who knows what. And that isn't always obvious when you first start dating them. And um, so I've seen some books, your book doesn't talk about this, but it's get your, before you get married, get their credit score because you, they may tell you whatever and you don't know. The, the things that people fight most about are children and money. And so those are important issues. And then finally is this idea of uncoupling well. Uh, it says, show, your book says so, show mutual respect, but you can't control the other person's actions. So make sure that you show them respect, that people are like campsites. You should leave them better than you found them, if possible. I guess in a breakup situation, that might be kind of difficult. That's chapter 15. And it has been my honor to take you through these chapters. And so I hope you have a great day, great relationships, and a great life.